There are just some things we never forget. They change our lives. And when we think about things, uh, the, the way we think about things changes our lives. And, and again, some of you know, I mean, my mom went to be with Jesus in February of this year, and there are just still some times that it's like, isn't that something? Weird. But we miss people that we love. And, of course, if you had anybody that died in 911 in 2001, you, you'll never... You'll never forget that either. Uh, That's true that happens for things in our world as well as in our journey with God. There's just some things that happen that we just never forget. Uh, You've been impacted, you've been influenced by events and people around you, whether you like it or not, whether you wanted it to be that way or not, you just are. And God's the only one that's in control. So we can either trust him or we can fight against him and say, you don't know, I know better, I'm going to take care of me, and good, good luck with that. Some of us have tried that in the past, it doesn't work very well. So it's important for us to know what we believe and why. So when it all hits the fan, you are not shaken. You are not like, oh no, so-and-so is doing this, and so this country's doing that. It's like, yeah, that's going to happen, and we need to pray and trust God. When stuff happens in people's lives and in churches, um, we make decisions about what we're going to do and how we're going to respond to those things. If you decide differently than your church leaders or your family um, decides, then you may hear these words, that's not how we do it. That's not how we do it around here. Have you ever heard that? Don't, don't raise your hand. Don't look at them. Don't look at that. That's just not how we do it. That's not how it's done. When, when Jesus began his ministry, his message was very clear. He said, the time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The time has come. The waiting is over. They were waiting for the Messiah to come, the chosen one. We are waiting for the second coming of Christ. And Jesus is saying the time has come. Something's been missing, but what has been missing is here now. And everything that came before, all of it was all preparation for what God is doing in this time, in this moment, in history. The kingdom of God is near because the king is in the house. The kingdom of God is near because the king has come. And Jesus says the appropriate response to the fact that the king has come and that God's kingdom is near is for us to repent and believe the good news. And we've talked about this before. To repent means to turn your life around, turn your life into the direction of God's kingdom. Focus on him. Jesus said, seek First, the kingdom of God, and the rest of life will come into focus, but you need to seek first. That's another way to repent, to turn around. If you're a pilot, it's to do a 180. You're going in one direction, you're in charge, and Jesus is saying you need to repent, turn around, and move toward the kingdom of God. In other words, face it and embrace it. Face it and embrace. Embrace it. Because Jesus said, I'm introducing a new way of living. It's not just simply a new way of dying. If, if Jesus is good enough for you when you die, you ought to try him when you're living. That's what he's inviting us to. And, and he wants us to know so much, Jesus would say, um, that God sees you, God sees this whole world, and he wants you to know so much that he sent me to show you the way. So repent, face it, and embrace it. It's a brand new way of living. Jesus introduces a new way of thinking, 
and he removes three obstacles to God. Right at the very beginning of Mark's gospel, there are three stories told that remind us and teach us, tell us that God, when Jesus came, he's removing some obstacles that religion had put in the way of God. If you're going to be a God follower, then you have to do... And these are some of the things that he listed in Perhaps some of the things that you, as we go through them, you'll be able to relate to. You'll go, oh yeah, I, I've been there. Oh yeah, I got told that, or I learned that. So unfortunately, over the years, the church took these three obstacles that Jesus had removed and reinstated them as being important in having a right relationship with God. In fact, one of these three obstacles, again, might be one that you can relate to, and so hopefully we can shed some light on, on that particular obstacle. The first obstacle is uh, Jesus, Jesus ignored certain religious rituals. Isn't it just something like the church and like religion, just to add a whole bunch of stuff? Well, if you're going to be a God follower, you need to do this, and you need to do this, you need to dress this way, you need to act this way, you need to hang out with these kind of people, you need to eat this kind of stuff, don't eat that kind of stuff, you need to drink this, don't drink that. If you drink that, you're going straight to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> Ever heard anything like that? Isn't it just like religious people, and we'll make up stuff, well, God said, well, God wants you, we dress to impress God. Right? You're hearing the fire trucks come in, aren't you? You're going, what's that? Yeah, they're backing in. They'll be there when you get out. Okay, hang on. We might need them. You never know. <laughs> so here's how this lesson starts. In Mark chapter 1, verse 40, A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, If you are willing, you can make me clean. In ancient times, Leprosy wasn't something that was diagnosed like we diagnose things today. So almost any kind of skin rash or skin disease or zits, if it was bad, uh, was, was designed, it would just, it just, anything physically scared people to death. And if you had some kind of a skin rash every, religiously, they would just immediately label you as a leper and and you were an outcast, and you couldn't participate in life, and you definitely couldn't come to church, because you have leprosy. They had to stay away from everyone. They had to actually announce their leprosy when anyone came near. Wouldn't that be fun? You could stand there and say, okay, I'm a sickie. I'm, I'm no good. Don't come near me. You might get sick. Wouldn't that be a fun way to live your life? Well, oh, don't come by me, I'm too this, I'm too that. We could just announce what's wrong with us. People with leprosy were unable to participate in life. They, they watched the world go on around them, but they couldn't participate. They were unclean. They watched their family grow up from a distance. They were outcasts, they were shunned. And no one, no one ever touched them. In fact, if you touched a person with leprosy, you became unclean. But this guy had faith that Jesus could help him. So instead of announcing, I have leprosy, I have leprosy, he says to Jesus, if you are willing, you can make me clean. This guy shows us what faith really is. Here's the definition of faith you can hang on to. Faith is being confident that Jesus can and hopeful that he will. That's the difference between faith and hope. Faith is confident that Jesus can do something. Hope is that you're hoping that he will do something. He, he may not do something. I don't know what you've been taught about faith and how faith works, but this guy's got it right. I know, I know you can, Jesus, but, but I, know, I don't know if you will, so I'm hoping you will. Faith is not telling Jesus what to do, and some of you have been taught that or heard that. If you just have enough faith, Jesus will do anything. 
No, no, you, you're not going to boss Jesus around. You, you're not God, and just because you can faith it doesn't mean necessarily you can have it. And again, some of you have experienced that. And again, I want to say to you today, this guy's got it right. Faith is knowing that Jesus uh, can. He's confident that Jesus can, and, and then you're hopeful that he will. So we're going to see just how Jesus met his needs and ignored religious correctness. Jesus' reaction to this man was shocking, and I don't know if you picked this up, but the next verse says that Jesus was indignant. You know what indignant means? I mean, he was worked up. He was angry even. I mean, he was filled with emotion. He was indignant. Now, he wasn't mad at the leper. How dare you come? No, it was, that's not what he's indignant about. Jesus was indignant at the situation. He was angry because neither the disease nor the social taboo associated with the disease should even exist. That we label people and cut them off and label them as outcasts. That should never even exist. This just shouldn't, shouldn't be. That This is not what honors God. And so Jesus did something that broke all religious rules. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. You didn't touch somebody with leprosy. Did you not read Religion 101? You don't do that. You might get it. You get cooties. Leprosy cooties. Don't, don't you touch somebody that's sick. Don't you do that. He touched the man's hand. Uh, if you touch someone that's unclean, then you are unclean, and you have to go to the temple. And there are hoops that you need to jump through uh, to get clean again. And the temple for them was in Jerusalem, about a six or seven day journey from where they were at if you're walking. So he reached out his hand, he touched the man, he said, I am willing, be clean, and immediately the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. It's just cool, we like that, right? But Jesus ignored the religious rule that, that uh, when he touched him and healed him, because Jesus' message was, the old was passing away, God's kingdom had come near. The old is passing away. God's kingdom had come near. And so look at what Jesus did. In verse 43, Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. Have you ever been warned by Jesus strongly? Oh, strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Go do what they want you to do. Show them that you're healed. Instead, verse 45, he did what you and I would do. <clears throat> Instead, he went out and he began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places, yet the people still came to him from everywhere. Just like the church, right? I mean, people just flock and they come and there's no room to sit because they just want to come and hear this good news. Yeah, that'd be great. Jesus told this guy to do what was commanded in the law and to do it as a testimony to the people who believed that that was what they needed to do to be healed. Instead, again, he just goes out and tells everybody. He tells everybody uh, that he's healed. And everybody wants to hear that. Everybody wants physical healing. We think if we're just physically whole, that's all that matters. And Jesus is saying that's not all that matters. Physical healing is way cooler than spiritual healing in our day and age. It was back then, and it is now. If you don't understand the kingdom of God, then spiritual healing is kind of like, whatever, you know, ethereal, out there, whoo, whatever, you religious nuts, okay, that, I mean, God and a relationship with God and peace with God that passes understanding, it's like, yeah, 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 just heal me, just heal me, and if you heal me, I'm going to tell the world, and this guy's out now telling everybody, 
which caused crowds to flock to Jesus because he could heal them physically. They weren't really interested in the spiritual part, which is why Jesus came in the first place. The old laws were passing away. Things were changing. The kingdom of God had come because the king had arrived. The second obstacle that Jesus removed when he claimed to have authority to forgive sin, that caused a great stir uh, with the religious people. And Jesus will be challenged and he'll, he'll be accused of blasphemy because only God can forgive sin, right? Everybody knows that. If you only have a half a brain, you know that it's only God that for, can forgive sin, right? No man can forgive sin. And Jesus sees faith and he forgives sin. Let me read it to you out of Mark chapter 2, verse 2. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. What word do you think he preached to them? The time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent. and Believe. That's what he's preaching. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. And again, you may have heard this story. Um, they bring this paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, get what they did. They got very creative. They made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through the roof there. They lowered the mat that the man was lying on. And I think when you're reading this story, you're thinking, was the homeowner there? <laughs> did he see what they were doing? Did he say, get off my lawn, get off my roof? What are you doing? He didn't, well, Peter doesn't give us the details. The homeowner must, must have been there, right? When all this was going on. And when Jesus was teaching, did, I mean, what, what, was it like all of a sudden things started falling on his head? I mean, how long did it take him to dig through? Uh, one of the gospel writers says it was a tile roof. So this was not just, you know, I mean, they didn't have uh, jackhammers or anything. I mean, they dug through the roof a hole big enough to get a guy laying in a stretcher. That, that's a big hole. But Peter doesn't give us the details because that's not what's important. But, but you need to think about that. Put yourself in that. If that's your house, and it's so full of people that want to hear Jesus, that somebody cuts a hole in your roof, that's a little extreme, wouldn't you say? You wouldn't, you wouldn't do that. I mean, it's a roof. You don't ruin a roof just for Jesus. Just to get to Jesus? These guys did. So when Jesus, uh, it's at the very end, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, when Jesus saw their faith, and again, you have to ask the question, how, how, how do you see faith? Oh, I have faith. Show me. Show me your faith by how you live, what you do. They were confident that Jesus could do something for their buddy, and they were hopeful that he would do something. And he did. He forgave their friend's sin. Cool? Isn't that great? The crowd, though, groans. Because mere mortals cannot forgive sin. And the paralyzed man kind of groans because that's not exactly what he dropped in for, right? <laughs> they didn't go to all that work so his sins could be forgiven, did they? They went to all that work so that he could get healed physically. That's what it's about. Not forgiveness of sins. I mean, that's like, whatever. Isn't that something? He must have looked at Jesus and thought, well, well, that's great, Jesus. Thank you for forgiving my sins. That's not exactly why we're here. 
But, but the crowd was stunned. Well, wait, wait, you're announcing that this man's sins are forgiven and no animal sacrifice has been made and there's no priest here overseeing this whole thing and there's no trip to the temple I and mean, we have to go to the temple. The temple is the place where God does his work. Some people still believe that today. It's the temple. The temple is where it happens. It's got to be the place. And they asked Jesus, do you think you're greater than the temple? Who do you think you are, Jesus? Do you think you can walk in here and replace hundreds of years of tradition? We have a whole system for forgiveness. Now, they didn't have apps back then, but they had a whole system, things you had to jump, hoops you had to jump through. And, and you think that just with a word... You can replace everything that Moses put into place for us so that we can have peace with God. Who do you think you are changing the law? Now, we know that's what they were thinking. And Jesus knew it, too, because Jesus knows what you're thinking. You know that? Here in verse 6. It says, now some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves. They weren't saying anything out loud, just like you are right now. You're not saying anything, but you're thinking. And Jesus knows what you're thinking. And I'm glad I don't know what you're thinking, okay? <laughs> Would not be a good thing for me to know, but he knows what you're thinking. Do you know that he knows what you're thinking? Okay, yeah. Well, he says... Uh, so in order for us and that crowd today to know that Jesus um, could, could hear what, what, what they were saying, he, he, well, let's go in here, verse 6. Now, some teachers of the law were sitting here thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Catch this. Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking. Not saying, thinking. In their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Note to self. Jesus knows what you're thinking. Not just what you're saying, not just what you do, he knows what you're thinking. Okay? Be careful of what you are thinking as he already knows about. So in order for us and that crowd today to know that Jesus can forgive and heal, he asks this question, really unique question, which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, which you're saying, that's blasphemy, you can't say that, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk, which one would be easier? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. So he got up, took his mat, walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone. They praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Never seen anything like this. God can forgive, so this guy can forgive sin, he says he can, and he can heal. Now, in the first century, there, there was this assumption, and I think it's floated down through the last couple thousand years, there was an assumption made that if a person was sick, or if they were born with some kind of a disease or ailment, that, that, that someone had sinned, that there was a direct correlation between sickness and sin. Somebody sinned. Um, they believe that sin always results in sickness. If something is wrong with you, it's because you did something wrong. That's what they assumed. But Jesus completely rejected that view. He held to the Genesis view, which was that when, man, when mankind sinned by disobeying God, sickness and death entered the human experience. Sin opened the door for sickness and death, but it's not the cause of sickness and death directly. 
it'll be a part of our human experience as long as we live our lives on this earth. But, but if you ever wonder if God can or would forgive your sin and, and not look at you through the filter of what you did or didn't do or what you said you were going to do and then didn't do or said you weren't going to do and then you do it over and over and over again. Can God look at you without seeing that filter of you? Can you actually have peace with God? The answer is yes, you can because the time has come. The kingdom of God has come near, and so we need to repent, change our way of thinking, and believe the good news that Jesus can and he will heal. One other obstacle that Jesus removed in order for us to have a relationship with God is that he was comfortable with sinners. That was just not the thing to do. If you're right with God, if you're walking with God, then those sinners need to get that out of here. Get out. I mean, go away from me because I'm right with God. But Jesus was comfortable with sinners. And you've heard me say this before. He liked people who were nothing like him. And they liked him too. And let me just throw this out. Do people who are not like you like you? And do you like them? Or do we set up these barriers and you, we don't cry, no, I don't like you, you don't think the same way, I, you don't vote the same way, you don't do what I think you should do. One day Jesus and his followers met this, followers met this horrible sinner. Levi was a bad man. He was a notorious thief. Everybody hated Levi. Now, Levi was a popular name in Jesus' time, so Mark tells us which Levi they meant. And it's kind of like, wait a minute, Mark was a Greek guy, and he's writing this. How did he know who this Levi guy was? Well, because Peter was telling him. Peter's telling him this story, and, and, and Peter is, that's the whole gospel of Mark, is Peter pouring into this young man. Mark Mark's writing it down. Peter probably couldn't write. Probably couldn't read. He was a fisherman. And first century fishermen, there was no need to read or write. They didn't do that. But this guy, this Levi, was a tax collector. Everybody knew that. He was the son of Alphaeus. So everybody knew who he was when he, he mentioned who his father was, son of Alphaeus. And, and I think, I mean, I just, this is just my thoughts, not biblical, but I think his last name was Brown. I think, because, you know, bad, bad Levi Brown, baddest man in the whole downtown. You think so? You think maybe that song was written before this Levi guy? (laughs) And what was the very first thing that Jesus said to bad, bad Levi Brown, baddest guy in the whole town? Once again, verse, verse 13, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him again, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, bad, bad Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth, and he said to him, follow me, follow me. And Levi got up and followed him. And you just got to know that Peter and James and John are saying, no, 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 that'll ruin our, we have a perfect small group. We like our small group. We all like each other. We're like each other. Nobody likes Levi. Don't invite Levi. He's going to ruin the group. Don't let Levi come to our church. I mean, send him, there's other churches in town. Send Levi to that church. They, maybe, maybe he can get some help there, but not here because he'll, Ruin the church. He'll ruin the neighborhood. He'll ruin our small group. We have this perfect little group going. Levi worked for the Roman government, and he would collect tax, as much tax as he could get out of his own people. He would cheat and steal from them. Everyone hated him. He was an embarrassment to his family. He was an embarrassment to his community. But he was rich. Because he basically stole people's money. 
But, but Jesus told Levi to follow him. It's the same thing that he tells you and I to do. Would you just, would you just follow me? Would you just seek me first? I'll, I'll change your life if, if you'll just do that. And you have to know that Peter, again, thinks this is a bad idea. Uh, but, you know, one bad apple can ruin the whole bunch, baby. You know, I mean, it, it's just like, no, we don't want this guy. And Jesus, what about your reputation? This is a lose-lose situation. We don't need Levi. We, we, we have the knowledge now that, that Levi goes by another name. Do you know who Levi is? Bad, bad Levi? It's Matthew. It's Matthew. You know, the Matthew that wrote Matthew. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's Levi. And you think, What? That Levi was a bad guy, and he wrote the first gospel we have in the Bible. What is that all about? Is that God doing an amazing thing in Levi's life? Didn't necessarily heal him, heal him physically. He wasn't the guy that was lowered in the mat, you know, and he wasn't paralyzed. He didn't have leprosy. But he was a bad guy, and Jesus forgave him and used him to... Write the first gospel in the Bible. Do hmm. you think God forgave his sin? <laughs> think God changed his life? I think so. And he will forgive anyone who repents. Anyone who faces and embraces their sin and turns to follow Jesus. That's the good news. That's why we gather. That's why we're here today. Jesus said the kingdom of God has come near and everybody is invited to participate. That would be everybody, even Levi Brown, even the paralytic, even the guy with leprosy, even those religious Pharisees, even anybody who will repent and because the kingdom of God has come near, you're invited now, Jesus ignored some certain religious rituals, and that made some people mad. But I want to say to you this morning, don't, don't let rules keep you from God. Well, I know I've heard people say, I can't go to church because I don't have the right clothes. Have you heard that one, or have you used that? Well, I just don't have the right kind of clothes. Do you think God is impressed with your clothes? If you don't have a tie, I have a whole bunch of ties. I used to wear ties all the time. If you want a tie so you feel close to God, I'll give you a tie. I'll give you a dozen ties, okay? If you want to do that, God doesn't care about what you wear. Just wear something, please, okay? That's... <laughs> Jesus ignored certain religious, religious rituals. He claimed to have authority to forgive sin. Jesus will forgive you. No matter what you've done, he will forgive you if you turn to him. And Jesus was comfortable with sinners. Again, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, if you're the baddest guy in the whole downtown, he still will forgive you. So, what's your next right step? What, what do you need to do? What do you need to do with the message that you've heard, this truth that we want to remember and hang on to and know that we believe that Jesus is bigger than religion. He's, he's bigger than what somebody might have taught you when you were growing up. He loves you and he wants to forgive you. So whatever that next right step is, would, would you just ask God, God, what do you want me to do with what I just heard? We'll play some music quietly and for you just to respond. If you want to write on the back of your Connect card your response, that would be awesome. We'll pray for you this week. And uh, so let's just take a minute and just ask God, God, what do you want me to do with what I just heard, okay? Lord, thank you for today, the reminder that your kingdom has come. Your kingdom is near because you came and you are here and you're calling us to yourself. And Lord, I just thank you for reminding us again, too, that following you is not about following religious rituals, what we do and where we show up and the hoops that we jump through, I pray, God, that you would help us to not let rules keep us from you, but for us to put our trust in you. Thank you that you have the authority to forgive sin, and you've forgiven my sin, and 
you've, you've forgiven the sin of people here who have trusted you and repented, turned around and said, God, I'm putting my life in your hand. Thank you that you have that authority because you are God in the flesh. You came in the flesh to show us how to live. And Lord, I just thank you that you uh, express not only to, to Levi, but to the rest of us who have gotten caught up in sin that that, that, that doesn't scare you off. Sin doesn't scare you off. We, we are all selfish and we all do things that we're ashamed of when we, when we recognize what we've done. Thank you, God, that you call all of us to participate in your kingdom. And I pray that you would help us, whatever that next step was that you mentioned to us, even in this last minute or so, that we would follow through on that and that we would take that next step to be right with you. So Lord, thank you for your truth. I thank you that the kingdom of God is, has come, that you brought with you new truth, a new way of thinking, a new way of living. Help us to live that out this day. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen, amen and amen.